Uh, so good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the idea of uh, this uh, briefing and this uh, meeting here on Zoom is to try to summarize six months of war uh, on the northern front of Israel, actually against the Shiite Axis, Shiite Iranian Axis, if you like, and trying to a little bit uh, look uh, forward. Um, I will start from uh, from a short briefing. Um, summarizing all the data that was gathered here uh, in Alma Center uh, about the, the war. I'm also adding here in the chat a link uh, to a report that we just published uh, today or yesterday, yesterday it was, uh, with all the information. Um, I want to say about this report that all the numbers that I'm going to give and the numbers that are uh, mentioned in, in this report are, are not uh, based on the amount of missiles that uh, or, or projectiles that were used and were launched against Israel because truly we don't know the exact numbers. What we had counted is the amount of attacks. There could be 80 missiles in one attack. There could be one or two or four, but we counted the amount of attacks against the state of Israel. And many of our conclusions are based of analyzing the amount of the various attacks and the types that we use, the types of the munitions that we use in these attacks. In general, all I can say is that we understand that thousands of rockets and, and missiles and, uh, were launched uh, to Israel and probably a few hundreds of drones and UAVs. Uh, the sources that we used are also not only sources in Arabic as usual, but this time, we try to cross information between sources in Arabic and uh, Hebrew sources, uh, and also what the spokesperson uh, published. Uh, and that way, trying to create the full picture of what was truly happening here uh, in the past uh, six months. Uh, Hezbollah claimed responsibility to 1,200 attacks against Israel in the past six months. This is a huge number. The average is about 50 attacks every week. But if we truly want to understand the reality, we cannot, again, base our data on just this number because Hezbollah does not claim responsibility to all uh, the attacks, especially not at the beginning of, of the war. And even now in the past few weeks, we see that Hezbollah is hardly taking responsibility for the launching of drones, even though uh, the amount of these incidents is raising dramatically. Uh, I believe this is because uh, it is afraid of the Israeli response, which again and again and again, each time there was a drone that was launched Israel, and there was damage, uh, Israel responded uh, against the aerial unit of Hezbollah. So uh, if we try to you know, give you some data uh, or numbers, like the war in the north in numbers, we have 60,000 Israelis that are evacuated by the order of the Israeli government. I know many numbers were thrown to the air about this number. Most of them are bigger. Uh, we had counted the amount of communities that were evacuated by the order of the government, 43 communities, and how many people live there. We have uh, no capability to trace the people that are coming and going, the people that are voluntarily uh, evacuated because they live in communities that hear the sounds of war but didn't receive an order to evacuate. And that's why the number that we pointed off is the number of people that actually compensated by the government for being evacuated and evacuated by the order of the government. This, uh, is, this, these communities are located in general uh, zero to five uh, kilometers from the Lebanese uh, border, but probably there are a few more thousand from other communities left. In the past six months, seven, is, seven civilians were killed uh, in these attacks uh, that I've mentioned. Uh, one of them was foreign worker, all the rest were Israelis and 11 soldiers. Um, we saw around 2,000 uh, demands from the Israeli government for compensation for damage by the heats of the rockets and by uh, the, the, the damages of the war. Uh, of these around 1,200, Building that were hit, including homes and public buildings. And... Let's talk about the types of munition. 
uh, that is being launched against Israel. The war started mainly with anti-tank missiles uh, that were launched mainly against military targets. The situation today is, is a little bit different. We see more use of rockets, more use of drones, as I've said, and this is good news and bad news because anti-tank missiles, first, even though there is a drop in the amount of anti-tank missiles that are used against Israel, it's not completely uh, vanished and they are still a threat uh, to the communities next to the border. These missiles are very accurate. Um, some of them can be even launched without a direct sight uh, to the target, those who are much more advanced. Their range is uh, five, six, seven, and even 10 kilometers. It depends again on the type of the missile. Um, we've seen since the end of the January that uh, Hezbollah is using uh, more and more the type that you don't need a, a direct sight to the target. And I'm uh, adding here in the chat now um, a link to a, an article that we published around that. Uh, so the bad news is that, again, with these missiles, no alert. It's impossible to intercept them with Iron Dome. I'm saying anti-tank missiles, but actually they are launched against many different uh, uh, targets here in Israel, and they are killing civilians, and they are uh, destroying homes, and they are targeted, uh, targeting basically different kind of things here. Um, the good news uh, uh, with regard to the fact that Hezbollah is moving uh, towards more of the use of rockets is that we know how to intercept rockets uh, but the problem is that these rockets are launched in bigger salvo than these anti-tank uh, salvos, of sometimes tens of rockets at the same time, and that way uh, sometimes they are missed and, and they do hit uh, the communities. Since they are inaccurate, they put uh, at risk uh, greater areas uh, each time, and since they are not accurate, even if Hezbollah is claiming that the targeted military targets in Israel, eventually they endanger us the citizens of the north. Uh, so that's like the good news and the bad news with regard to the change in or the shifts in the, the types of munitions that Hezbollah is using. Of course, if I'm talking about the drones, we have seen a raise of uh, three times, more than three times more use of, uh, of uh, UAVs uh, against uh, Israel in the past month, uh, which are much more accurate than the rockets. It, we can intercept them, but sometimes we miss and we saw the damages uh, a few times. Uh, their range is up to 120 kilometers, but actually, uh, as we've seen in this war, uh, they are launched to up to a few tens of kilometers from the border. Another type of missile that, that, that I want to talk about is the uh, Burkan, or actually heavy missiles. Uh, Hezbollah started to use these heavy missiles since November. 70 times uh, again, not 70 missiles, but 71 times, maybe more than one missile in each time. Uh, they were launched to Israel. Vulcan missiles are heavy, uh, meaning around half a ton, creating a lot of damage, flying very low. Again, challenge to intercept uh, short range, up to 10 kilometers. Um, on March, we've seen the first time that these missiles were launched deliberately uh, to Israeli communities, Shlomi. And Hezbollah admitted that it was a deliberate launch of Vulcan to his recruit. Uh, in January, Hezbollah started to use another type of heavy missile named Falak, uh, only 50 kilograms only, but still very heavy, again, to short ranges. And we've seen this happen. Last type I want to talk about before moving forward to other issues is missiles uh, around the area of uh, surface-to-air missiles. That their mission is to intercept the Israeli drones that are flying in Lebanon or other uh, aerial vehicles. This happened 18 times. Uh, that Hezbollah claimed responsibility uh, for launching these kind of missiles. We didn't see too much of a success with this, maybe once or twice. I invite everybody to write your questions in the Q&A, and I will try to address the, these questions uh, right after the briefing. Hezbollah is the main organization in this campaign against Israel since October 8th. Uh, October 8th, yes. Uh, the Northern Front was open in October 8th. But there are a few more organizations that we should mention that are participating in these attacks. Hamas from Lebanon, 
which in the past few years became uh, much more developed, much more uh, established in the refugee camps, uh, uh, Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, a Muslim Brotherhood in Lebanon, a unit named El Fajr, a Islamic Jihad, a Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Lebanon, Amal, which is supposed to be kind of an, a Shiite local alternative to Hezbollah, they are also participating in this war. Uh, Imam Hussein Division, which is another proxy of Iran that uh, uh, was composed of Iraqis, Syrians, um, uh, Iraq, I'm sorry, Iraqis, Syrians, Lebanese, whatever, and we've seen that uh, at least part of it was assigned uh, to South Lebanon to participate in the in the in these fightings, in these attacks against Israel. The National Socialist uh, Syrian Party and uh, the Lebanese resistance battalions, which are actually uh, subordinate to Hezbollah. Uh, damages in Lebanon, IDF. Let's talk about the attacks uh, in, in, of the IDF in Lebanon. IDF published recently that it had attacked uh, more than 4,000 targets in Lebanon. <clears throat> it's important for me to emphasize at this point. Uh, IDF publishes almost every day uh, videos of uh, of these attacks in Lebanon. And what you usually see is uh, a building explodes or it even looks like a home. But actually, this is a military target. The whole idea of the military deployment of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and especially in South Lebanon, is using the Lebanese as human shields. And all these buildings that you see exploding, and sometimes we can even see uh, uh, more and more explosions after the initial uh, explosion, uh, these are all military uh, infrastructures of Hezbollah, warehouses, headquarters, uh, observation posts, whatever. Uh, 4,000 uh, targets that uh, were bombed by the IDF in South Lebanon. And that's, that's a lot of targets. Most of them, by the way, in a range of, uh, again, zero to five kilometers uh, from the border with Israel. 10% uh, of them are uh, uh, targets used by Radwan brigades, which are the commando units of Hezbollah. So if I'm talking of kind of a mirror picture, uh, yes, uh, 90,000 Lebanese uh, are evacuated around, okay, the numbers are again, like over here are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, accurate, but uh, around 90,000 evacuees in Lebanon. The difference from Israel is that these are voluntarily evacuated, uh, Hezbollah already no, no, uh, stated that it will compensate them. The Lebanese government also stated that, but I have little belief that they will do so. To remind everybody that Lebanon in the past few years is in a deep uh, political crisis. There is no president in Lebanon. It's a, an interim government. Uh, economic crisis, only this week it was published that 82% of the Lebanese are considered poor. Uh, lack of uh, basic uh, needs sometimes, while well, Hezbollah is taking care of its own base, providing a lot of these uh, basic needs along the years, including in Ramadan, we've seen distribution of food, for example, and things like that. Like every year, it's no different. Like every year, they have done so this year. As, well. mm -hmm. as of uh, today, uh, 273 uh, casualties to Hezbollah and a few tens more for the other factions that I've mentioned. But what is important in this uh, information is that 66% of this number lived and buried in, in south of the Litani River, meaning south of the area that was supposed to be free of any illegitimate uh, weapon by the resolution of the UN that ended the previous war. So this can give us a little bit of an indication to the question of withdrawal of Hezbollah from the border or a pushback of Hezbollah from the border. This is a fiction because they, they will not withdraw from areas that they live in. Targeted killings by the IDF, we have seen 18 uh, sometimes very senior officers of the IRGC that were killed uh, in the current war, including the attack uh, last week. We'll talk about it in a minute. In most of the, all of these are in Syria. Uh, 13 Hezbollah senior commanders and four Hamas senior commanders. Uh, these are Hezbollah and Hamas. These numbers are related to Lebanon. Uh, if, if I've mentioned Syria, uh, since this war started, we had 11 attacks that came from Syria of mainly rockets uh, towards the Golan Heights. Uh, 
Uh, we assess that uh, this is mainly Palestinian factions. Uh, Iraq, Islamic uh, resistance in Iraq, that's kind of a general name for an umbrella organization to few proxy militias of Iran in Iraq. They started in October 17, the attacks against American forces in Iraq, and later on, they also claimed responsibility to attacks against Israel. In recent weeks, we see a range in, a raise in this, in the attacks against Israel. They claim responsibility uh, mainly to launching uh, drones, but probably if it is, if this is happening, we don't have enough indications, but if this is happening, they're probably not succeeding in getting all the way to Israel. And it, it happened, but very, very rarely. Um, what um, I want to say something about these attacks against Americans, uh, we've seen like more than 160 attacks, uh, different numbers around that as well. But the bottom line is that since the end of uh, February, uh, there is kind of an unofficial ceasefire. We don't know exactly what's behind the scenes. But I can tell you that in the past two weeks, we do see again uh, these factions uh, from Iraq, uh, the Islamic resistance of, uh, of Iraq, taking responsibility to attacks that we have no confirmation anywhere else that were actually, that these attacks actually happened. And this is a big question what's going on there. Uh, Yemen uh, also participated in this war, uh, and we had around 100 attacks from coming from the Red Sea against Israel and against. American uh, forces and against uh, international ships that were or, or uh, carriers that were identified uh, as uh, some kind of Israeli. In many cases, they were even wrong. It was not Israel. Okay, this is with the data, with the information. I want to say a few words about our insights, trying to analyze the data, and of course, um, then I'll go to questions, which you're all invited to write uh, in the Q and A. Uh, so since the beginning of the war, we see a clear raise in the amount of attacks of rockets against uh, civilian targets. Now, I want to say something here. When we made this analysis, we counted civilian targets as targets that are clearly civilian, meaning that Hezbollah claimed responsibility to targeting civilians in Israel. But also we counted uh, incidents or launchings, which Hezbollah said that these were against uh, military uh, targets, but actually they fell in communities. The hits were in communities. They endangered uh, civilians. And this is happening in most cases uh, when the ammunition is inaccurate. But again, in, not in all cases. We had different kinds. Um, so bottom line is that 43% of the uh, targets that were attacked by uh, Hezbollah since this war started, 43% were actually civilian targets in Israel. Since the beginning of the war, as I've said, Hezbollah expanded the different types of munition that it had used to attack Israel. Kind of part of an equation, meaning that we see that uh, if Israel is attacking that, Hezbollah, like, uh, if uh, Lebanese civilians, for example, are getting killed, Hezbollah is targeting civilian targets. If Hezbollah is launching drones, Israel is attacking uh, the aerial uh, unit of Hezbollah. And that's why sometimes you see attacks uh, in Baalbek, which are further uh, up north in Lebanon, uh, because this is where you can find uh, important infrastructures of this unit. Uh, bottom line is that we can say that after there was an initial raise in the amount of attack uh, every day, in the past few months, it is pretty stable. Um, uh, pretty stable of uh, around a little bit less than 10 uh, attacks every day, which enabled Hezbollah to deal with the criticism of how come it didn't join in full scale with Red One invasion, etc. On, on the other hand, uh, facing the criticism on the other side that says that this is an unnecessary war for Lebanon, so that's why it is framed only to the south, only to special areas without deteriorating uh, to a full-scale war, and that way saying we are just helping Hamas in a very limited way, stretching the forces of the IDF. Of course, these statements are becoming more and more meaningless as the campaign in Gaza is 
getting to its end. And we heard, we all heard the news yesterday that there is only one Israeli brigade in Gaza. Um, where this is ending exactly, Nasrallah, uh, the leader of Hezbollah said again and again and again that when there will be a ceasefire in Gaza, there will be a ceasefire in the north. But uh, for now, even though there is no uh, IDF maneuver with big divisions in Gaza, it's not a ceasefire, it's not a declared ceasefire. So this uh, enables to Nasrallah to continue the fire as it is. As I've said, it's pretty stable uh, also from the north. Uh, and, and this is all part of the idea of unification of fronts, which this is an Iranian campaign that was meant to create a situation that Israel will face a multi-front uh, campaign against it, uh, the, which this is what we are actually facing uh, this way or another. I think that uh, many expected that this campaign will be pretty much the same from any, every front. And what we have learned is that the Iranians establish different militias with different interests in different places. And that way you see different type of campaign from different places. But uh, again, it uh, made Israel uh, face and treat and uh, you know uh, allocate forces uh, to all these uh, fronts at the same time. If you're looking at that from the point of view of the Israelis that are living here, I, I want to say something here. The, the, you know, uh, inside, I don't know if you know, but inside Israel, there is a debate about the question of the evacuees, whether we should, the Israeli government should tell them to go back. Will they go back if, if the Israeli government will tell them to go back and all these questions? The first thing that is important to mention here is that uh, the anti-tank threat didn't exist in the south. It didn't happen. Okay, maybe maybe it existed, but it didn't happen. We didn't see Hamas launching anti-tanks in wide scale uh, in in the south only during the, this uh, invasion. <laughs> um, of course, now uh, most of Hamas military military capabilities are eliminated, but not all of them. Here in the north, this became kind of a tactical weapon that is used every day. Uh, against the communities and, and created the feeling that we don't have enough answer to this. Uh, at the same time, uh, in opposed to the South, that they had shelters and Israel government built shelters to everybody, including in the schools, etc. Here in the North, we don't have enough shelters and many buildings were built before 1991 and they are not uh, protected. Uh, and and that that way, it is really uh, problematic to tell the people to go back under fire while rockets are still uh, being launched, in opposed to the situation in the south that people live uh, for 18 years actually under fire, under the threat of the rockets. And this is without starting even the, the, the conversation about the option of invasion and the fears of the Israelis from another invasion point. Look, what Hezbollah wants, um, it's, it, it's really difficult to say at this point. But at least we can all uh, agree that Hezbollah wants to preserve the situation as it is, and maybe even wants to escalate, but not by its own initiative. Meaning that uh, it gained an achievement. 60,000 Israelis are evacuated. I talked about the difficulties to bring them back. Uh, as long as possible. Um, what's the uh, operational achievement of the IDF? Uh, as I've said, 4,000 uh, targets that were bombed is a very impressive number. This means that uh, the, the, the area of defense, I'll put it this way, the area of defense, maybe there is less presence of Hezbollah there, but eventually the villages are very, very close. The Lebanese villages and the Israelis, by the way, are very, very close to the fence, and we do see uh, launchings from these villages, from these homes inside these villages, and even mosques in the, inside these villages. And this is continued to happen uh, all the time. And IDF continues to fight that. So even though IDF attacked uh, 4,000 targets, 11 or maybe more, Hezbollah continues to uh, preserve capability in its uh, fire arrays, whether it's rockets, uh, UAVs, and anti tanks, even though, as I've said, there is probably kind of a damage, this damage is not enough to stop the fire. Um, I'll put uh, in the chat now again a link to 
to a very short piece that we wrote uh, on, on this specific uh, question of the capabilities of preserving the capabilities of Hezbollah with this respect. So I can't, you know, I can't have a briefing about the past six months without saying a few words about the past week, which was really interesting and, 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 and didn't end yet, meaning we don't know exactly how everything is going to play out by the end of this specific week. Uh, last week, uh, there was a, a targeted killing against the most senior Iranian uh, officer, uh, Hassan Madawi or Zaidi, he has, he has different names. He was the, the commander of the Northern Front against Israel in this campaign. Uh, and the target killing uh, took place in a very symbolic place, next, right next to the Iranian embassy in Damascus. And we have an Iranian promise to retaliate by the end of Ramadan or by the end of the holiday that ends Ramadan, it, meaning either Tuesday or, or Friday, uh, this Tuesday, meaning tomorrow, or Friday, um, American intelligence published that uh, their assessment or information, I don't know, that Iran will retaliate with missiles and UAVs against Israel. Uh, we don't know from where from Iran, from Iraq, from Lebanon, from Syria, there are, you know, that many options. Uh, and of course, the, the question from where also um, uh, indicates on the question of how Israel will defend itself with regard to from where it is going to be launched. It's, it's, it's a different way of prevention if it's from Iran or from Lebanon. In any case, we've seen IDF raising the alert, uh, drafting reservists in, in specific arrays like intelligence, aerial defense uh, systems and home front. And yet, uh, again, as a resident of the North, I can say that the instructions to, to the home front remain uh, the same. And truly the, the feeling of uncertainty is huge because maybe the Iranians will keep their promise and, and retaliate. Maybe Israel will succeed in prevention of this retaliation. And maybe the Iranians will decide to postpone the retaliation <clears throat> because of the fact that we are that prepared. I truly don't know. I'm just giving you some options. Um, so if I'm putting aside for a moment uh, the question of, of the specific week with specific retaliation of Iran, I want to end the briefing with the question of what's the solution, which I'm being asked all the time uh, by the people that I meet. And, and during this war, you know, we heard in the media mainly two options. One option is a prevent preemptive attack which I think this term is a little bit misleading because we are already in war. <clears throat> um, preemptive attack will put Israel as the completely aggressor and we are not the aggressor here. We were attacked in October 8th. Uh, preemptive attack would mean that Israel will uh, diminish I don't know, strategic capabilities of Hezbollah. I am not saying 100%, but probably will have some kind of achievement around that. But it also means a lot of damages to both sides. And we know that. Uh, it will mean an all-out war. It would mean uh, thousands of rockets that will be launched to Israel. On the other side, there are those who said, well, let's have a diplomatic arrangement. I'm not saying agreement because you cannot expect an agreement with a terrorist organization. But arrangement, arrangement meaning that there will be some kind of arrangement with the mediation of France, United States, with the Lebanese government, that it is clear to everybody that behind it stands Hezbollah. Except Hezbollah refused to discuss. And uh, Hezbollah said very clearly, as I've said, that as long as there is no ceasefire in Gaza, there is no ceasefire in Lebanon. Uh, so all we heard until now in the past six months is different ideas around this diplomatic arrangement. And if I'm trying to summarize all the different ideas, what I see is that um, the framing is a redrawal or pushback of Hezbollah uh, eight to 10 kilometers from the border instead of disarming of Hezbollah 25 kilometers from the border, which is a, a reflection of, of the resolution that ended the previous war, 1701. <laughs> Uh, UN, United Nations Security Council resolution. Um, the idea of, of these 10 to 8 to 10 kilometers is to push away the anti tank threat, but uh, there is nobody's talking about a deadline. Nobody's talking about how do you monitor that. Uh, 
the most of the suggestion talks talked about uh, uh, relying on on the current mechanism, which is the Lebanese Army and Unifil, which were ineffective in the past seventeen years. So I don't see how this is going to change. I think that uh, every solution needs to include this arm deadline enforcement uh, with an effective force that will be willing to clash with Hezbollah, since Hezbollah is not going to disarm in South Lebanon just because it signed an agreement. So what do I offer? Um, I think the IDF is trying to go on a third path, except I'm not sure it is doing so uh, enough. Okay, um, I think that the IDF, when you look at the amount of uh, targets that were bombed in Lebanon, is trying to create a military achievement without getting to a full-scale war. But in order to get a military achievement, you need a little bit more uh, than what is being done now. Um, and I think that once there is a ceasefire, then it doesn't matter what it is, uh, IDF will have to establish uh, a solid defensive plan for the communities to present it to the residents uh, in order to uh, give them the, the, the feeling that they can go back home uh, and to draw very specific red lines of Israel that if, it, if things will not change in South Lebanon, Israel will operate even in the price of, of renewing the, the conflict or renewing the campaign. Uh, and of course, all of that must be done with the building of, I wouldn't say a coalition, but maybe international legitimacy uh, to this full package of how we are going to make sure that we are not going to be massacred again, but this time from the new. Um, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, I hope I uh, succeeded in give you, giving you a kind of a wrap up picture of what is happening here in our northern border and, uh, you know, based on the research that we are doing. You're all most welcome to enter to our website. I think I did it right this time uh, uh, with the links. And um, if you like what we do, uh, you are all most welcome to donate as well. Alma is an organization based on uh, donations and our mission, as I've said, is to give you as much information as possible on what's going on here. So thank you very much. Please spread the word about uh, what's happening and what we are facing. And thank you for supporting us. Bye-bye.